Good morning. Well, I guess, yep, I can get away with still saying good morning. So uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this is the fourth session in the Cisco sponsored track room. My name is Gary. I'm the host and MC for the day. Uh, we do have one more session after lunch today. Uh, so I hope you can come back and join us then with uh, Lou Tucker and uh, Stephen and some folks from SAP. But we're going to get going right now with uh, what you're all here for and uh, to hear from Jerome and Ian, two of our most senior engineers at Cisco, on super fast network performance with Th with VPP, thank you. It's been a very long week, so <laughs> with that, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Oh, one quick thing. As you all came in this morning or today, you should have gotten a little card. We are doing a drawing at the end of the session for a very, very nice Philips Bluetooth t uh, speaker. So fill out the cards. We'll grab the cards at the end and do the drawing. Gentlemen. Okay. Can you? Does yep. it, yep. Okay. So uh, thank you for coming. We are Thursday, and it's just before lunch. So I'm not sure this is a, the best uh, time slot. But uh, we'll try to be as quick as uh, possible. But if you have any questions, uh, we'll have a long Q&A session afterward. So my name is uh, Jerome, and I'm uh, managing this uh, networking-VPP project. And I'm working with uh, Jan as well as uh, other engineers, including a guy by the name of uh, Navin Joy in the room here today. Uh, before we start, who in the room is already familiar with VPP and FDIO? Okay, so that's a good uh, 40 40 percent. So, what I'll do is uh, I'll tell you a few words about what is VPP and uh, why we are trying to integrate that into. Uh, OpenStack, and then uh, I'll hand over to Jan, who will explain you the, the design principles and the architecture of the software. Uh, so VPP, to make it simple, is, a, is an extremely fast virtual switch. It's a data plane that is extremely fast and can process huge amount of packet per second. You will get more details afterwards. And that can be used to, uh, for east-west communications in, inside a VM between different VMs or for north-south communication when it goes to the physical world. So that's based on DPDK. And that, uh, the, the way it works is that uh, the, the reason why it's called VPP, it's vector packet processing, because instead of working packet per packet, it works vectors of packets uh, by vectors of packets, and you will get more detail afterwards. And what we are trying to do in the frame of this project called Networking VPP is to make sure that this virtual switch is properly integrated into OpenStack and that anyone using uh, VMs, VNF, can take benefit uh, of that. We want it to be simple, robust, and production grade, so we are not looking at uh, fancy feature to start. We really want to have something production grade to be used in the cloud or for VNF in production. So it's not a toy. It's something that is designed to be in, to go in real life in production. And uh, in order to do that, we want to comply and to adhere with all the regular OpenStack uh, rules, including blueprints, code reviews, uh, mailing lists, blah, blah, blah. So we have an open community working on that, and uh, if some of you are interested to work with us, uh, of course, you are more than uh, welcome. So, Jan will go in more details on this topic, but uh, just, uh, just to give you a rough idea of what we are trying to do. We want to, to, to do a software which is highly scalable, not only in terms of uh, packet per second, but also in terms of number of nodes we can deploy, we want something really simple to operate and to debug because some of you might have some uh, experience with a virtual switch and uh, that's not always super easy uh, to operate and to debug. So uh, we, want, uh, we want that to be simple to operate. And of course, because it has to be deployed in real life environment, high availability is not an option. This is something you need to get by design, by default and uh, we'll explain you how we did that. So in terms of efficiency, so, so what, what we did to, to, to reach these goals is um, all the communications are REST-based and JSON-based. You'll see that there is a, 
uh, etcd software which is used as a cornerstone of this uh, project and uh, everything is uh, based on asynchronous communication. So when you create a port, you give the order to create a port. So this is a desired state. And then later on, when the port is actually created, you receive this information. So all the things you do when you want to do uh, async communications, which is really useful for distributed systems. And in terms of uh, high availability, we use a neutron journaling system as well as key value store based on etcd. HCD currently is not be, being used in cluster mode, but eventually it will be used in cluster mode to provide you know, what we, the best availability that you can think about. And last but not least, code is small and easy to understand and debug. So today we are speaking about a new project, very interesting project, but at, at the end of the day, if you have the look at the number of lines of code we are speaking about, it's between 2,000 to 3,000 lines of C code. So that is extremely comp compact. And the reason for that is because of this architecture, REST communications, and because it's, we, we started from scratch. So that's, uh, that's another advantage. Um, OK, so for those who are not familiar with, uh, with uh, VPP, so VPP vector packet processing is one of the project of the pro of the FDIO project. So Fido, FD.io Fido, is a project under Linux Foundation, and uh, it's a multi-project project. So you have VPP, which is this uh, fast data plane, virtual switch, virtual router. But then you have other projects such as uh, CSIT, which does uh, continuous integration. You have T-Rex, which is a packet generator. So we have many many projects. Um, Fido is a, is a project being driven by, uh, you know, uh, Intel, Cisco, Red Hat, Ericsson, so different companies, different level of involvement. And the, but, the, but, but the VPP software itself has been designed since 2002. So it's not something new, it, but it has been open sourced last February. So the fact it's open sourced is, is really new. But the software is, is rock solid now. So again, what makes it uh, different from other vSwitch is that it's, uh, I think there are several things. One is that it's extremely fast. And it's really important to be extremely fast because we now want to deal with multiple 10 gig links. And multiple 10 gig links means that you want to have like 150 cycle per, clock cycle per packet which is not a lot, right? And you cannot achieve that if for each and every packet, you need to fetch states from memory. So what we do here is we process vectors of packets per vectors of packets. So we get a bunch of packets on which we apply similar processing. And that makes us able to warm the cache with the first packet and then to process all the remaining packets which are belonging to the same vector, but without the penalty of cache effect. And that's a very important way to a uh, very, very, very significant speed, of, uh, speed up in terms of, uh, of performance. That is based on DPDK, but nothing you know, forbids you know, is, uh, us to use other interface in the future. But today, it's fully user space, only DPDK, and um, that gives us very, very high performance. Very, very high performance for physical interface but also very, very high performance for the host user kind of connections between uh, virtual machines and the vSwitch. So that makes perfect sense both for cloud and for NFV kind of uh, environment. Recent results, you know, performance results we did, you know, in, uh, based on uh, 1609, which was released in uh, September, as you can guess. Uh, typical processing on two, two threads, two hyper threads, one core. It's uh, like uh, 10 gigabit per second. So in this setup, as you can see on the slide, we inject 5 uh, million packets per second. And then uh, these uh, 5 million packets per second are going to a VNF or to a VM using VOS to the interface. They are sent back, so all in all, in 5 plus 5, which is 10 million packets per second. And that is only on one core. And that scales really linearly with the number of cores. So this is something you can reproduce if you, ju you just have to go uh, to, to download the code and, and, and do this setup, that's really easy to, uh, to reproduce. And we are increasing that with multi-queue support 
for, uh, for next uh, releases. Anything to add on these topics? Uh, no, I think that's good. Uh, what are the main components? So the design is actually very simple. We have developed a mechanical driver which sits on neutron server. And uh, this, uh, neutral, this uh, mechanical server have to populate uh, states into uh, an etcd key value store, right? To do that, we use um, this uh, JSON REST APIs. And then we have all the compute nodes who are watching state changes on this, uh, on this uh, etcd key value store. So as soon as the new desired state is available for a given node, this node is, uh, wake, wakes up and retrieves the states and populates that into VPP. So VPP is a data plane only, and it's not a control plane. So we have a Python API that uses a shared memory with VPP, and that's, that sits on the uh, agent side and the compute node side. So we retrieve all these uh, states, populate that into, uh, into VPP, and once the port is created, we give this information back to etcd, and that is given back to Neutron. So that's, uh, that's the way it's, it's done. And one of the benefits of this architecture is that it's extremely simple to debug. If you are familiar with etcd, you can do a simple etcd watch CLI command, and you will see all the ports created, all the ports deleted, uh, various states. That's extremely easy to, uh, to analyze. So this is... Uh, the architecture, and yeah. Jan, perhaps you can uh, yep. comment that. So um, what we're trying to do here, uh, and, and another reason for using ETCD, is what we're trying to uh, implement is a model of distributed state, not distributed commands. So instead of telling each of the agents what it must do next, which means you've got a stream of commands running out to the agent, and if the agent gets behind, then the backlog increases phenomenally, then ETCD stores the state it should be in. If it ever loses track or if it gets behind, it can always catch up to the current state. So uh, our aim here is that Neutron, when, when you run a Neutron command, as you would normally, as you're, as you're bringing a virtual machine up, or even when Nova does it for you as it's starting a virtual machine, then we store that command in the Neutron database, the same as usual, um, so that you can retrieve it so that Neutron's got consistent state. And then we, um, we put it in a journal within the database at the same time, which gives us the ability to do it synchronously within a single commit. We're guaranteed that the operation succeeds or fails as a whole, which means that you're never getting into awkward states if there's any kind of system failure. Um, a, a background thread then takes that and pushes it into ETCD. Uh, we use a background thread so that the uh, user space calls are always very fast. When, when you tell Neutron to do something, you're saying, I would like you to create a port. Neutron is always effectively saying at that point, I'll see about that at some point in the future. Um, and then the background thread is, is part of actually getting the job done. But it doesn't make the user wait to hear that the operation has succeeded. Uh, and then from the back end, the agents, uh, for efficiency's sake, watch ETCD for state changes, and individually the state changes. Every time they see something new that they've got to do, they go and tell VPP to get that sorted. Um, if, as I say, they run out of history, and, and ETCD has a limited record of changes, if they do run out of history, they don't get into the backlog state, but they instead say, well, I'll just catch up with what's current. I'll go and find the whole thing, and I will resynchronize everything that I'm doing. If the agents die, or if VPP dies, then they go to the state and they say, well, I know what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I will go and make that happen. So the architecture is designed so that failures in any of these systems or intermittent network connectivity problems don't cause you issues. Uh, and we can all wish that failures don't happen, but if you're running a system that's got tens or hundreds of servers and you're running it for weeks and months on end and if in the case of NFE where you're a service provider and your main source of income is absolutely dependent on this system working flawlessly then you have to tolerate failures and this is what we've designed it to do. Um, oops. Yeah, so um, there's also a little bit to talk about here in terms of the port binding workflow. So port binding is when Nova and Neutron together try and come to an arrangement about where traffic is dropped off from a network so that, v so that the virtual machine can then go and pick it up. And there's a whole bunch of um, slightly asynchronous calls that go on between Nova and Neutron to kind of negotiate that settlement between the two of them. Um, what we do uh, is, again, slightly different from, from what other mechanism drivers within Neutron do. Uh, we 
um, propagate that information through ETCD whenever Neutron, uh, Nova says, I would like to bind this port to that host over there. So we tell, you, you know, we put something in the, in the ETCD state saying that the, that host is the place that's now where this, this traffic needs to drop. Um, and then the agent on that host will go and try and um, land the information in a, in a common point, basically a vhost user interface. This is the shared memory fast interface that we use for virtual machines to user space switches. Uh, and ultimately, uh, when it's done that, it will notify back to the Neutron agent again through ETCD what it's done, and Neutron will tell Nova asynchronously. Nova gets the virtual machine all prepared and paused, but it doesn't actually start the virtual machine until that binding is completed, so that when the virtual machine actually starts to run, it's got working networking, and it can actually get its DHCP addresses, um, because obviously that's pretty much the first thing that a, a virtual machine will do. Um, having done it this way, we, the change is basically that um, we are completely um, certain from top to bottom, Neutron the server, but also Neutron the agent, that the whole system is set up and that message that's being given to Nova says we are absolutely ready and we're totally certain at this point. Um, and it, it's also fault tolerant. Nova here in this particular instance uh, will time out if Neutron doesn't get its job done in time. So um, the fault tolerance is, is the same as you usually find with mechanism drivers. Um, so uh, our key value store here, we've used ETCD. Uh, it's a fairly common key value store. Um, uh, it's a synchronous key value store, that's kind of important. So when you've written something, then any reader from that point on will get the information you've written. And as I say, it keeps notifications and it will send notifications. If you're watching a subset of the keys within ETCD, it will tell you when any of those keys have changed so that you can do updates on demand if you want to. But if you fail to get the update, if you find the connection has dropped, or if you think you've dropped out of sync, then you can always go and get the entire state from ETCD. Um, uh, as Jerome was saying, debugging is, this was a side effect. We didn't expect this. We're so happy that it works like this. Uh, if you've ever tried to work out what OVS is thinking when you're debugging Neutron and why it's configured the way it's configured, horrible, don't go there. It's a miserable experience. There are about four different ways that OVS gets its properties, plus all the IP tables. Not pleasant. Um, in this instance, ETCD contains a breakdown of what you're trying to configure, what, what, what you want um, the... Uh, VPP to be doing, and you can simply compare the VPP state, has a nice little CLI, so you can always look at it and see what it's doing, with the state that you're seeing in ETCD, and you can see whether it's sensible or whether you've got a bug, which is great. Um, and in fact, one of the things we're looking at doing there is actually adding a few pieces of um, debugging checking code at some point in the future, so that we can, given that the information is there for the administrator to check, we'll just write a script to pull both and compare to see whether or not everything is working properly or whether there's been some sort of fault. Um, and within the ETC data structure, we basically, we set the, the data structure up uh, in a slightly interesting way. So there's an outbound set of keys that are always written by the Neutron server in the center of this. And there's an inbound set of keys that are only ever written by one individual agent. So you haven't got agents trampling over each other, changing things that each other are, you know, information being put into a key from six agents at the same time. And you haven't got the server and the agent fighting. It's always totally clear where any bit of information has come from when you look into that data to store. Um, this is admittedly a horrendous, I, I should blame Jerome for this particular slide, a fairly horrible uh, exa example of what comes back from ETCD. It looks pretty nasty, but the key bit in the middle there is the highlighted section, uh, and that should look fairly familiar if you've ever seen what a port looks like in Neutron. It's a whole bunch of settings that you find on a port that describe its MAC address and how it's bound and a whole bunch of bits and pieces. Um, and that's basically our method of communication. We just trim down the port to the bare essentials, we stick it into ETCD, and that allows the distribution to go on. Um, and a little bit, little bit more there, um, uh, perhaps slightly nicer formatting, but you can see there, there's nothing terribly surprising in this, it's just boring old uh, neutron information that describes how the network is working and where the packet needs to be landed. Um, so we have a list of supported features, uh, and as Jerome was saying, the aim here was to perhaps, I keep saying this to people, people will always talk about building in security from the ground up. You must remember security is the first thing that you build into an application. I wish they would remember that when we talk about robustness as well. If you want something to be robust and highly available and fault tolerant, it has to be the first thing you design into the application. And that's what we've done here. So we set ourselves a sort of timeline to stage the stage, firstly, a framework that would do what we wanted, and then we brought in features one by one. So, so far what we've got to is it works with flat networks and with VLAN networks. 
Um, it works with vhost user ports for virtual machines, um, but it's also capable of connecting to the namespaces that, that Neutron already provides for DHCP, for metadata, and for routing. So all of the DHCP metadata and routing features exist today, and you get them just as you'd expect. Um, the DB journaling bit, uh, that was added a little after we first got it in. That was the synchronization to make sure that um, ETCD is always in sync with the database and never loses a change. Um, so we added that just a, a, a step or two down the road, um, and it actually was surprisingly simple to do, I have to say. Um, uh, we've supported the HA scenarios. We can restart the agents. We can restart the drivers. We can restart the server. We can restart ETCD very carefully because it's redundant, so you tend to want to restart it one, one node at a time, but we can. Um, and uh, we've also managed to get this uh, deployable. Obviously, the first thing we did for our own benefit, honestly, was to get a dev stack plugin working. You can certainly uh, go and uh, download, that, um, download VPP using dev stack today, and it will deploy a dev stack with VPP running and configured in it. Um, uh, we've also got it working in the OPNFE Apex installer, which is a triple O-based installer that, that Cisco and Red Hat collaborate on, um, and that's working today as well. Um, and we've looked at uh, integrating it a little bit with Red Hat's packages. Um, most of what we're doing here is either um, in Red Hat's package repositories, so ETCD is easy to get hold of, or you can download pre-built packages like RPMs for VPP components. So again, you know, it, it's usable today in reasonable systems. For test, I would suggest not production just yet, but you can certainly get a handle on it and see what you think. Um, so uh, the, the next um, bits and pieces that we're planning on dealing with is um, it might seem odd that we didn't implement security groups up front. Um, there's two reasons for that. One is, as it happens, if you're doing NFE, then you often find that security groups are the thing that you first turn off because they slow everything down. And if you're looking for the absolute flat out straight line performance, then, then for NFE, um, it's not what you want. So, so we put that on one side for the time being and said we'll do that um, second. Um, but also security groups and anti-spoofing require a little bit more work on the firewalling functionality of VPP. Um, so we've talked to the VPP team. They're actually implementing some APIs for us right now, and we hope to have um, that implementation uh, released with our second round of releases, um, which should come with the next release of VPP in January next year. Uh, and we're also, oddly, a strange service to think of, but we're looking at the TAP as a service functionality because, again, if you're working with NFV applications and networking high-performance applications, being able to take a copy of the traffic that's coming in is absolutely critical to being able to debug what's just gone on with your application. It's not the infrastructure's working, but the application's not working, or the other way around. How can you tell? The only way to tell is to have decent debugging functionality. Uh, and obviously, um, and I would admit, I'd be the first to admit that, that testing kind of came slightly late in the day with what we're doing, but we're working on our enhanced uh, test plan, um, uh, more in the way of unit tests for the code, which fortunately is very small, so the unit test should equally be very small, but also, more importantly, integration and feature tests to demonstrate that in a deployed system, it's actually doing its job. Um, and then there's a couple of things we've been talking about in the longer term. Uh, one is telemetry. So it's really useful to be able to get out statistics from your virtual switches to see what's happening with your network and where the network load is. Uh, and some, sometimes even down from just port load to individual load on certain kinds of flow or certain ports on a virtual machine. Um, there is quite a lot of that already in VPP. So we're looking at how we can pull that data out and make it consumable uh, by OpenStack users. Uh, and also, we, we, I, this was actually a discussion yesterday morning, how we can make VXLAN support work. VXLAN is supported within VPP, but configuring VXLAN is very different to configuring VLANs. So, so that's something we're planning on down the road. Um, and, oh yes, and I should mention, in fact, uh, Colorado here. Colorado is the release for uh, OPNFE of their integrated system. So, so they have a number of combinations of installer and components that together deliver an NFE platform, an NFEI as it's known, or a VIM. Uh, in, uh, in NFE world, um, and we're actually trying to get this into, the, well, we have this in the Colorado automated testing through that uh, Apex deployment system now, and we're seeing whether we can get this into the next, uh, the next release of the Colorado version of the OPNFE platform. So hopefully in the next few days you'll hear how that's going, and I'll be able to uh, give you good news on that subject. 
Um, but yes, if you're interested in looking at this, then obviously we're now an OpenStack project, so you can find our Git repository under the OpenStack repository. Uh, you will find, obviously, us on review.openstack.org. You're welcome to uh, review our patches and tell us that we can't write code, um, which people do to me a little more often than I would like, but such is life. Uh, and obviously, you can submit patches as well, and we'll give them a good hearing. We're always pleased to see people using this and trying to make it better. Uh, and there's a launch pad there. If you use it and you find that something's not working, then we would be, we would be happy that you file as a bug. Bugs are good. We like bugs. We don't like bugs, but we like having bug reports at least, <laughs> uh, and uh, even blueprints as well. So uh, again, please come and join us, participate in the project. OK. So that's. Okay, I'm live. Uh, we've got some times for some time for questions, or you guys did. Oh, okay, here we go. All right. Yeah, I just had a question about. There's also a, an effort to uh, build an open daylight based control for VPP. Yep. Uh, using GBP. Yep. Currently, yep. and just wondered if what you know, how do you compare contrast uh, the the two. Uh, it's a good question, uh, and I've had that question before. <laughs> I, I totally understand that it's confusing that we would do this twice over, um, but there's a logic to this. Um, this model here is very simple. As I said, two and a half thousand lines of code, and it gets your functionality working. Um, this model here will get you um, virtual machines connected to each other into the world. Um, but there are a lot of things you can do with networking. There are a lot of APIs we could potentially create um, to do things like service chaining, uh, connectivity to MPLS, connectivity to LTTV v3, or whatever other tunneling pr um, solutions that you, you find in service providers. And again, if you focus on the service provider world, um, no two service provider networks use the same technologies and are configured in quite the same way. So we know full well there's a lot of variety out there. This is the simple version. This is the one that's intended to be useful to most people. Um, Open Daylight is the complex version, which lets us add more shiny features. Now, it may be at some point in the future you'll want one of those shiny features and you will go and use Open Daylight. But at least in the meantime, you can use this and see how it works for you. And it may be that this will serve for all of your needs as well. This is actually perfectly fine for, for typical enterprise and, and similar workloads. OK, well, two, two for the price of one. OK. Uh, have you guys done any kind of benchmarking with ML2 OBS versus uh, networking VPP? Um, we've done some. Um, I, I'm going to look pointedly in that direction, but I don't think Alex given me some test results on this yet. Um, we, we've certainly done tests of OVS alone against VPP alone. Uh, and, uh, and this is a point um, Jerome made earlier. We, we always talk about packets per second when we're talking about this, because packets per second are interesting, and simple overall bandwidth is kind of boring, honestly. I can fill a 10 gig link, and I can get OVS to forward the traffic of a 10 gig link, and that will work just fine. And when I do that, I'll be using something like iPerf, and iPerf will be sending 1,500 byte packets down the link, and the packet rate will be down here. I mean, it'll be well under. Well, it's, it's a few hundred thousand packets per second that you're looking at. Um, VPP is good for 14.8 million packets per second on that same link, which is a 64-byte packet filling a 10-gig link. So the difference here is uh, not can I fill 10 gigs, but how many packets per second can I get down that link? Now, when we've tested the two things alone, um, and I believe we've published this information, again, you probably want to check on the OPNFE website, um, we found that we can fill 10 gig link with 64 byte packets. You need to be very careful about how you configure things, and I'd like to know how close we are to that with VPP, with networking VPP's config. But we can fill a link quite easily with, with VPP, whereas if you start shrinking the packet size of OVS, you find that you're down to about 1,200 bytes, and you're already starting to see packet losses. Um, when you get to 64 bytes, there's a dribble of traffic going down that link. So, so there is a distinct performance difference between OVS and uh, VPP. Um, a slightly more comparable version would be OVS DPDK with VPP, and I know we have some results on that as well. Uh, it's certainly better than stock OVS in the kernel, but it's still not terribly high performance by comparison. In addition to that, uh, I'd like to add a couple of things. One, uh, we, may, we ran a test uh, done, did by the EANTC uh, to compare OVS DPDK versus uh, VPP. So that's something which is uh, available. And then we are also publishing regular uh, results because uh, under FIDO, you have this uh, CCIT project I was speaking about, you know, and this project does for every commit, you know, you do uh, uh, performance testing, benchmarking, blah, blah, blah. So you can get all these results. 
And last point on this topic, we had uh, in Seattle, there was, during last uh, ODL summit, uh, there was a presentation about uh, what is the typical uh, throughput you can get at zero packet loss. That's very important because you can have different uh, numbers in terms of throughput if you accept uh, like dot two percent packet loss. That's very, very different from zero packet loss, right? So you have full uh, benchmark with this level of details. It's not a comparison, it's absolute results in that case. Thanks, guys. Any, we're there, okay. Anybody else, any other questions? That means you guys did a really good job. Thank you, and you are- Thanks again to Ian and Jerome.